from day to Sunday, and then the offering of the Feast of the Sacred Heart. <clears throat> Third Sunday after Pentecost, and here again, long prayer in the epistle for this Sunday within the act of the Feast of the Sacred Heart. Third Sunday of Pentecost is taken from the first epistle of St. Peter, chapter 5. Dearly beloved, be you humble under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in the time of visitation. Casting all your care upon him, for he hath care of you. Go with about seeking whomsoever he may devour. Whom resist ye, strong in faith, knowing that the same affliction befalls your brethren who are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto eternal and eternal self glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a life forever and ever. Amen. In the Gospel, taking that according to St. Luke chapter 15. At that time, the publicans and the sinners drew near unto Jesus to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spoke to them this parable, saying, What man is there of you that hath a hundred sheep? And if you shall lose one of them, doth he not leave the ninety-nine in the desert? And go after that which was lost, until he find it. And when he hath found it, lay it upon his shoulders, rejoicing. And coming home, called together his friends, and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my sheep that was lost. I say unto you, that even so there shall be joy in heaven upon one sinner that doth penance, more than upon ninety-nine just who have need not penance. For what woman, having ten groats, if she lose one groat, doth not light a candle, and sweep the house, and seek diligently until she find it? And when she had found it, she called together her neighbors, her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found the growth which I have lost. Then so I say unto you, There shall be joy before the angels of God upon one sinner doing penance. That's what we're for today's Holy Ghost. Amen. Days ago, the feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, a special feast for our times. In the Sacred Heart, we remember the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. As requested, we have a devotion to the Sacred Heart, Pope Leo XIII, consecrated the 20th century to the Sacred Heart. And that we have the Sacred Heart this Sunday within the Office of the Sacred Heart, which I think the time was chosen for the Sacred Heart because of the Sunday Gospel today, in the Sunday Epistle. On the gospel about the sinner doing penance, but today a consideration on the, on, on the receiving end of the sacred heart, that we are the receivers of the divine love, but the receivers of the divine mercy, because of the great love of our Lord Jesus Christ. But today a consideration of the heart itself in battle. Go ahead and can you get up and the Father and Son goes to men. The fathers tell us that one of the symbols of the sacred heart. The great uh, Cistercian priest tells us about a, a thousand years ago was Absalom. And we know that Absalom himself was a very wicked man himself, but on his last day, he was a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he was, he was said to be the king, and for a short time he was the king. But he had to flee. Because Joab came after him, and by the command of David, he had to be put to death. And so therefore, he escaped, and he ran, he rode, and he rode with great haste away from the uh, from David's army, and from Joab. But David said to his soldiers, he said, you must preserve my son Absalom. Do not kill Absalom. And then, preserve Absalom, my son. And all heard the command. Absalom ran quickly. He was very handsome, very strong, and like Solomon, I mean, like Samson, he had long hair. And as he was riding through the forest, his hair got caught up in the branches of a tree, and his horse went out from under him, and he hung between the earth and the, and the, and the air, hanging by his hair in the air. And then Joab and the soldiers rolled around him and looked at him, and they mocked him. This is the great Absalom. He's dropped his sword. He is hanging in the air. He is hanging by his hair. He is helpless. And Joab then commanded the soldiers. And Joab said, Kill him. 
And the soldiers then said to Joab, they said, we heard the command of David ourselves, for it was in our own hearing that we heard David say, preserve my son Absalom. Therefore we will not obey your command. And none of the soldiers would obey Joab. So Joab in anger then took a spear from one of the soldiers, and he threw it into the heart of Absalom. And he pierced the Absalom heart with a spear. But Absalom was still extremely strong. And the scripture tells us that the spear, the spear pierced his heart, but he was still strong, and with great strength, he still panted with breath. And Joab was angry, so he took a second spear, and he pierced the heart of Absalom with a second spear. And, then, and behold, he was still strong, and he still panted with great strength, hanging between the air and the ground. And therefore Absalom took a third spear, and he pierced the heart of Absalom with the third spear, and even then he still remained in strength for some time, and then he finally died. And though Absalom, of course, in person was a wicked man, he is there as a symbol of the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ, and also of the final battle, the battle of the devil, as he tries to defeat a soul of a saint. Now remember that there is the mystical body of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the mystical body must experience what the physical body experience. And what is the final place of combat? The final place of combat is the heart. Now when we speak of the heart, when we think of the heart nowadays, we think very much of the beauty of the sacred heart of our Lord Jesus Christ, that our Lord Jesus Christ forgave us our sins. But what does the heart do? The heart moves us. The heart raises one up. We say that a great warrior, he is magnanimous. A great warrior, he is not great because of his muscles. He is great because his heart cannot be overcome. And as the, the Cistercian priest told us, behold, he was pierced with a spear, and yet he still fought, and he was not dead. He was pierced with a second spear and a third spear. And so he was pierced with three spears, and he was attacked in the by the three attacks of the devil, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And there are many symbols of this, of this spear that attacked him, but the world could not defeat his heart, the flesh could not defeat his heart, and the devil could not defeat his heart. After the three attacks of the devil and all the weapons that he had, the heart still remained strong. And here the fathers tell us his heart was strong. And therefore, the spears of the devil could not kill his heart. And he hung from a tree by his hair. And here we see the hair we reminded of Samson, who, hung, who, who was great, who had the strength, he was the anointed of God, and he was anointed of God because of his hair. Anointed of God told Samson, it is in your hair that is your strength. For those that follow Christ shall find strength in what the world calls weakness. They shall not find strength in their muscles. They shall not find strength in, 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 in their weapons in their defense systems and their friends, the strength is in the hair that is consecrated to God. And so that the consecration to God is our strength. And our Lord Jesus Christ showed that he also had this hair when he was going to his death, and they took a cloth and they put it over his head, and they beat him in the head and said, prophesy, who is it that struck thee? And therefore Christ, however, his helmet did not protect his head. His helmet protected his hair. And so here we wear this helmet, which is the amice that we wear at Mass, the amice of the priest, that is a cloth garment. We touch it to our head before we put it on, and it symbolizes the helmets. You wear a helmet when you go into battle. And then with the helmet that we wear is made of cloth. The helmet that we wear is not visible to man. I am wearing the helmet now, but you cannot very well see it. And so our Lord Jesus Christ says, you are going to go to battle. But I say you as lambs to the slaughter. Now, what did our Lord say? Well, we are going to war, but we are going to war like lambs. We are not going to war like lions. And we are going to war like lambs to the slaughter. Now, imagine the lamb that knows he's going to be slaughtered. He does not run away. The lamb goes into the place of the slaughter. What makes the lamb do that? And the saints tell us, what makes us we be willing to, St. Thomas says, no man can desire to die. No man can desire pain. But a man can tolerate death. A man can tolerate pain for the sake of something else that he loves. 
Now, what is it that we love? My first day in Phoenix, Arizona, and if I was stationed there, I arrived from the airport, and I went from the airport 15 minutes over to Lady of Sorrows in South Phoenix, and on my arrival, the man at 7th Street Baseline, Baseline, we're at 7th Street Baseline on one side, the Taco Bell is at 7th Street Baseline on the other side, and a man was murdered at the Taco Bell for $4.13. He didn't want to be robbed. The gangbanger killed him and took the and for four dollars and thirteen cents. That's what he stole. The man died for four dollars and thirteen cents. What is it that we're willing? To, to, we, he loved his money. He didn't want it to be taken from him, and therefore he died. And Saint Thomas says, "What is it that makes the heart of the warrior faint? What is it that makes the heart of Christ come down to earth? And what is it that makes the heart of a saint?" Fight. And we are all supposed to be, the priest, of course, is altar Christus, another Christ. But we are to be in time, we are to be other Christ, and our Lord allows we hang upon a cross. Why is it? What's the warrior aspect of it? Why does he allow his hands to be nailed? Why does he allow his feet to be nailed? Because he wants to make it clear that our weapons are not the weapons of hands, they are not the weapons of feet. He allows us to hang from the earth to the ground. And also, we hang like Samson did, like, like, Saul, like Absalom did, from our hair. Remember that when Samson got his hair cut, he lost his strength, and he was defeated. But when Absalom did not get a haircut, and he hung from the tree, his hair made, he hung from the tree, he had no weapon, he was pierced with three spears, and yet he was still in the fullness of his strength. What is it that causes the death of Christ upon the cross? It is his will. He died of his own will. And so it is with the warrior of Christ. We are now in one of the times of the battle of the church. We're in a time right now where the church is tied down. Its hands are nailed. There are no longer blessings coming from the priests. There's no longer excommunications. The feet are nailed. We're no longer carrying Christ to the very ends of the earth. We hang above the earth between the, between the air and the ground. We no longer rule upon the earth. The church is no longer has reign upon the earth. Our land has been taken from us. Our churches have been taken from us. We hang in the air. Is it a new thing? Our feet are tied. Is it a new thing? And of course we carry Christ wherever we go. And yet the people don't want to hear about Christ. They don't want to receive Christ. They don't know him. They don't love him. They don't want him. Can Christ still conquer the world? Can he still conquer his enemies? Will he still defeat them? Now notice what happened at the cross. The scripture tells us that the enemies, particularly Caiaphas and Annas, and the others that were there, they didn't want to wait the whole length of the battle. And many of them left the battlefield, leaving only a few soldiers to guard Christ. But Christ never left the battlefield. He had his sacred heart waging war. Yes, the sacred heart is about charity towards those whom he loves. He sheds his Christian's blood upon the cross because of obedience to his Father. But he is fighting. He is waging war. He is, he is the spear of the world, the spear of the flesh, the spear of the devil, and there are many other symbols of the spear that I can't remember, but there's the, the spear of the world, the flesh, and the devil, the spear of the various attacks of the devil. These spears are not going to harm him. He is defeating them with his heart. And we must understand in our present battle that it is by the heart that we shall defeat Satan. It is by the heart that we win this battle. And remember, when the church is attacked, like any other kingdom, we are the outer walls, we defend the outer walls of the city, but then they conquer the outer walls, so we retreat to the inner walls, and then we retreat again. And the final citadel is our heart. The final citadel is our heart in which is contained living faith. The dead faith is dead, but living faith remains. Remember, our faith is not just a collection of beliefs. It, is not, it must be alive in this world. It must be alive. Remember those years between the time that Jeremiah buried the fire, the living fire that was lit by God himself, when Moses started the Old Testament, 
And there was a time of darkness, and the Jews all wandered away from God, and they didn't believe in God. And Jeremiah took the fire, and he buried it, and he hid it, but the fire never went out. And Judas Maccabeus came, and this is going to happen soon. Judas Maccabeus came, and he found the fire, and he digged it up. And they brought the fire back to the temple. And also Ezra did the same thing. They brought the fire back to the temple. Rather, Ezra brought the fire back to the temple. Ezra brought the fire back to the temple 150 years later, and the fire relit. The fire did not go out, and Ezra did not light a new fire. And this fire will remain from the time that God lit that fire in the heart of Adam when he repented for his sin after the original sin. And that fire will remain until the end of the world. And the last place where the fire burns is in the heart. There must, the, the, what does it mean in our warrior time right now? Yes, we must preach against the heresies. We must, we must, we must fight against some of the foolish things going on, the idiotic wearing of masks and so on. We must fight against certain things. But how do we win the war against Satan? Only by the divine love inside of our hearts as warriors. We must have the divine love inside of our hearts. The divine love has to be inside. And this is the way we fight. This is the way we win. We are hanging upon a cross. We are abandoned everywhere in the world. The feet are taken from us. The hands are taken from us. We are scourged and crowned with thorns. This is what has happened to our holy church. But the devil is very wise. <clears throat> the devil knew that when Christ was dead upon the cross, he was not defeated. And the, Christ, and the devil was still terrified of Christ when he was dead upon the cross. And the devil has not changed. Right now that he has conquered the papacy and conquered the episcopacy and conquered the priesthood and conquered all the parishes and conquered all the faithful and conquered all the families. And only a few individuals throughout the world are maintaining the holy faith. The structure of the church is being used in order to propagate all manner of evil. And the devil seems to have won, but the devil knows that he has a great fight. And the devil knows he has to destroy the heart of our holy church. He must destroy the heart of our holy church. And therefore he has lined up Longinus. And he has lined up a spear. And when our Lord Jesus Christ is dead upon the cross, Satan has not finished his work. And Christ has not finished his work. There are many fools in the outside world that think the battle is almost over. But in fact it is at its greatest moment now. When our Lord Jesus Christ's heart was pierced with his lance, out came blood and water. That water is a water of grace. That water is a water of baptism. That water is a water that gives us life. And that water was hidden inside of that heart, and it had not yet come out. It had not yet come out until the spear was penetrating the heart. And that is why, what is the statement of the early centuries of our church? The blood of martyrs is the seed of Christians. Times have not changed. Now our martyrdom is not going to be always bloody. The martyrdom is going to be the pers moral persecution that we experience now. But the blood of martyrs, and it will also turn to blood, the city heading that way right now, but the blood of martyrs is the seed of Christians. The blood of martyrs is the victory of Christ. And we must ask the grace that we have the power and that, we, that Our Lady gives us strength to actually be have the heart of martyrs. And why are there martyrs? Because we love God more than we love ourselves. Because we love souls. What was in the mind of Abraham when God said to Abraham, I am going to destroy Sodom and I'm going to destroy Gomorrah? What was in his heart? Abraham, the man of faith, what did he say? You're going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Those two wicked cities, worthy of damnation, worthy of fire. Those two wicked cities whom I hate very much, plus the other two cities are right next to it. I, I hate these cities. I hate the evil they stand for. But in those cities is Lot, my nephew. And I want to save Lot. And furthermore, let us save the whole city. And therefore he bargained with God how to save the city. Now this is the time in our holy church's history. Well, we must imitate Abraham and bargain with God. 
It is now the time to imitate Abraham and bargain with God. The Lord, wilt thou save our country? We are not worthy of salvation. We are not worthy of being preserved from the worst punishments in America. But we know if there are ten just men, God will mitigate his hand of justice upon us. So what do we pray to God for? Lord, if there are a hundred just men, wilt thou save our country? I will. No, but it will not be saved. And so we know the number, ten just men. And then we pray that there be nine others. Let there be ten just men. That should be our prayer at this time, to save our country. There is an attempt to destroy our country right now, an attempt to create civil war, completely, completely destroy our country, and then obliterate us and make us part of the new world order, the order of the Antichrist, and to, make a, and to create great tyranny and horror upon our people, and that those who are now barely living in some moral way, their morality will be taken from them. Now God allows us punishment for many blessings. One blessing is people will not wake up if they don't experience pain. And if they don't wake up, they're damned. And therefore, it's a blessing. And secondly, God will mitigate the pain if there are ten just men and still allow there to be a waking up. And thirdly, we must recognize that we know the prophecy of Our Lady that we're getting close to her victory. What is necessary during this fight? Maintain the heart. It is the final citadel. If the body is dead, but the heart is alive, we are alive. <clears throat> you see, the modern fools, the modern fools believe that brain death is enough. If the signal between the brain and the heart isn't working, the brain and the bodies aren't working, they claim you're brain dead. But in fact, the brain is always working, including when it goes flat. And when the heart is beating and breath is coming out, there is, we are alive. And the life must remain inside of us. The heart is where the battle is right now. Are we ready to maintain our faith with our hearts? Are we ready to die for our holy faith? Are we still ready to spread that faith even in this time of challenge and difficulty? We're in the battle of the sacred heart inside of our holy church. And the spears are coming. But no, the three spears of the devil cannot harm us, cannot defeat us. We must defeat them. We must defeat the, the attacks of Satan and realize that it's a time of war. And what happened when our Lord, very, very quickly, what happened? 5,000 were converted in 53 days. 54 days. Pentecost, Pentecost, Monday. 5,000 came to the church. And then the church then spread like wildfire throughout the earth. And though they persecuted the church and brought out martyrs starting with St. Stephen, they were not able to stamp out the fire of the divine love. They were not able to stamp out the, the movement of the whole of the sacred heart. That once that spear penetrated the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ, and out came the Holy Mother Church, this church could not be defeated. And now the church is about to go through a true renewal. The church is about to be purified, and there are about to be made saints, and there are about to be made warriors of our future time. There is about to be a great conversion. And before this great conversion, there must be a purification of our Holy Church. And we are now at the ending stage of the purification of our Holy Church. And what must be done? There must be saints. We must become saints. And what does this sanctity mean? It means that love of God and love of neighbor is what motivates my choices. And love of God, love of neighbor, is what moves me. And also, I have to have in that heart confidence, a complete confidence that the enemy is defeated. We all know it intellectually. Satan knows it too. But it is an intellectual high-in-the-sky knowledge. Do we know it in our daily battle? Do we know it if they're fighting the discouragements of daily life? It, this knowledge must drop down into our heart. It must seep into our being. And we must make we must ask of the power of the sacred heart to enter into us. And remember also Joab. Joab is important. Joab was the general of David. Joab was given a direct command by David to preserve Absalom. Joab gave direct orders, kill Absalom. And what was the beginning of the salvation? The soldier said, I will not obey your wicked orders. Just like right now, the Joab, who is the vicar of Christ, David is Christ, and Joab is the vicar of Christ. 
And the vicar of Christ has commanded us to kill Christ. The bishops are commanding us to kill Christ. The Pope is commanding us to kill Christ. And what will we say? We have heard, Pope Francis, we have heard in our own hearing that we are not to penetrate the, the heart of Christ. We are not to go with the world. We are not to go with the flesh. We are not to obey the devil. We are not to follow the heresies of Vatican II. We are not to follow the ways of the modern world. We're not to dress like them. We're not to act like them. We're not to be like them. We have heard this in our own ears. We heard God say to you, Joab, Francis, Joab, John Paul II, Joab, the bishops and popes of these last 50 years, we cannot obey that command. And there, what has happened? Therefore, Joab took the spear. It was Paul VI that took the spear. It was John Paul II that took the spear. It was Benedict that took the spear. And now it's Francis that takes the spear in order to penetrate the heart of Christ in direct disobedience to Christ. But who is the one that killed him? And notice also concerning Joab. After Joab murdered David, murdered Absalom, David did not kill Joab. David did not kill him. But what happened? When David was a very old man, Joab was slightly younger than him. He was still alive. And when David was about to die, he turned to Solomon. He said, Solomon, you will become king. God will gift you with wisdom. Here is my instruction. Remember Abishai? He's still alive too. Remember Abishai, when I was a young king, he was a young man, and he mocked me because he was a son of Saul. I said, let him live. Remember Joab, he disobeyed me, and he murdered the, 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 uh, the, 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 the general of the army. The general of the army, the good, the good general. He murdered him in battle so that he would become the king. He would become the main general. And Joab murdered Absalom. I let him live. Do not thou let them live. I forgave them. You do not forgive them. When I die, one of your first acts as king is to go and kill Abishai and put him to death. And go to Joab and kill him and put him to death. This is my command. Our Lord, right now there are wicked bishops and there are wicked kings. And right now they are ruling their way and having their way. And we forgive them. And right now we allow them to do their wickedness. And right now we accept their blows. But the Lord does not forget what did David show when he said those words about Joab? That he is the symbol of Christ. And what did God say? Vengeance is mine, I will repay. We know that Christ's sacred heart, his heart forgives his enemies when they repent, but his heart crushes and destroys his enemies when they do not repent and the time of repentance is over. There is nothing more powerful, nothing more vicious, nothing more, more terrifying than the sacred heart. When the heart of a just man turns to wrath, beware of all those that are in his way. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the name, the mouth of David, said, Solomon, Joab thought he would live. Kill him. Now what happened? How did Joab die? And where did Joab die? He died in church. There is a rule of the Old Testament, also passing to the New, that when a man goes to the church, he is in sanctuary and he cannot be killed. Abishai was killed. David died. And Solomon sent the soldiers to kill Joab. And Joab ran into the temple so they would not be killed. And the soldiers came to Solomon and said, Solomon... Joab went into the temple. We can't kill him in the temple. What should we do? And Solomon said, go to the temple and kill him right there at the altar. And so they went into the temple and they killed him. Now the justice of God shall grind exceeding small. When this entire crisis is over, be not afraid that those wicked bishops, whether they moral wicked like Cardinal McCarrick, 
Or they be or they be and theologically wicked like Cardinal Ratzinger, who is far more wicked than Cardinal McCarrick. And the other most wicked ones is Cardinal Ratzinger, whom are who the blessed who, 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 who sat on the table across and they said, You, Cardinal Ratzinger, are working with the deep Christianization of society. You are working to destroy society, and we will not work with you. We cannot work with you because we have cross purposes. Cardinal Ratzinger shows no signs of repentance. And there shall be a divine justice. The sacred heart is not only the heart of forgiveness, it is the heart of war. And this war shall have an end, and in the end, the sacred heart shall conquer. And the heart of our Holy Mother, the Church, shall have its victory, it shall have its conquering. And those who are most wicked, they shall be killed, and we will find, what about the God of mercy? The God of mercy shall turn to the new Solomon, the new Pope after the chastisement. Look at all those bishops that say they're sorry. Some of them forgive. But this wicked one, and that wicked one, and the other wicked one, put them to death. Burn them at the stake. They will not all be forgiven. And this wicked king and that wicked king put them to death and burn them at the stake. Don't worry. Dr. Fauci and Hillary and Bill Gates and Cardinal Ratzinger and Cardinal McCarrick and all these wicked ones throughout the world on all the different levels, unless they undergo a great repentance, which is very unlikely, they shall receive the vicious justice and the most hard justice in heart. They shall receive it. And why shall it be so violent and so eternal? Because of what the heart loves. What does the heart of Jesus Christ love? He loves his sheep. And these souls, these wicked ones, they have attacked the sheep, they have spit on the sheep, they have slain the sheep, and they have had no mercy upon the sheep, and they have not repented. What shall the good shepherd do with his staff? He isn't going to beat them until they're dead. Every single time that sacred scripture refers to their anger of the sacred heart, it never has an end. Never an ending. Never. If you are lukewarm, I will begin to vomit you out of my mouth. But there shall be no middle, and there shall be no end. The Lord shall empty his quiver upon the dam. There's only one problem. His quiver is infinite, and it shall never be empty. He shall make them drink the cup of bitterness. And after they have drunk all of the cup of bitterness, he shall break the glass, and they shall eat the glass. That's what the sacred scripture says. And the justice of God grinds exceedingly small. The devil was very wise on Good Friday afternoon when he was terrified of that heart. We love that heart. It is our protection. It is our hope. But the enemy is terrified of that heart. And the enemy knows that that heart shall destroy him and this heart must be inside of us. So we must ask the grace of this heart enter into us, and it's not possible without the love of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It is not possible. She is going to cross the head of the serpent. She will be like Queen Esther. Remember Queen Esther when, when the king said to her, I have killed Mordecai, I have killed the, not Mordecai, the, the, the bad one, Amon. I have killed Amon. Is it enough? She said, no, it is not enough. For there are Jews all over the kingdom of Persia that are being persecuted. And let all the persecutors be put to death. Send a decree to the very ends of your kingdom that all the persecutors be put to death and the Jews be saved. For the Blessed Virgin's immaculate heart is also most powerful. And she shall crush the enemies of God. She is the one who shall crush the serpent with her heel, and it shall be a most violent crushing that shall destroy his kingdom, the kingdom of Satan. And we are now entering the final stages of the battle before her victory, and we must have a heart that is ready to die, a heart that is ready to fight without arms and without legs, 
a heart that is ready to hang in the air and yet still be, be able to fight. But well, why was the heart strong, say the fathers? Absalom hung from a tree by his hair. His heart was strong because his hair was attached to God. His heart was strong because he was connected to heaven and not to earth. Therefore, though he fell off his horse, he did not fall upon the ground. Though he was removed from his horse, he was not moved from the ground. And he hung from a tree, as one day our Lord's described the leg from a tree. Remember the wisdom and strength of our church. It is not in the place of the world. And so let's ask the grace to take on that wisdom. To learn the sacredness of the hair. It's interesting, the last few, last few months, we go to jail, we're getting a haircut. Can't, can't, uh, can't take a haircut. Maybe we have more Samsons running around. But the fact is, we need Samsons. We need Absalom's in a spiritual sense. We need to take on the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is learned from being in the arms and the hands of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So let's enter into that arm, into those hands, and let's take on the strength of the heart of our Lord in this holy fight, so that we are found to have the heart of Christ inside of us when the time of the great victory comes. Most thank you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.